It's high noon. It's Wednesday, and you all know what that means. Uh, time for LA2M. Is that Welcome. Welcome. Hope you can hear me okay. Welcome. My name is Derek Merriman, CEO of Ingenix Digital Marketing. And I'm up here with Stacey Hallix from Dollar Bill Printing, your local digital print shop. And this is LA2M. Uh, I'm just curious, is there anyone here? Anyone, any first timers? Any LA2M first timers? Look at that. A, a bunch of you. Welcome, welcome people. Um, thanks for making it. We, we've been going on for now for six years, every Wednesday. And you finally got on our radar, so we're really pleased to have you here. We do meet every Wednesday. Uh, we take off July and August, but for the rest of the year we're here. And uh, we always have essentially free programming. So we, uh, the model is we bring in really talented and smart speakers. They teach you something for around 30 to 45 minutes. Um, everybody gets a chance to introduce themselves. So it's a good networking opportunity to meet some people. And um, if you want lunch, as you know, there's the menus on the table, $10 lunch for Conor O'Neill's. And uh, that's all great. So we, LA2M, for those of you who don't know, is a 501c3 nonprofit. And to that end, we have these new sponsor cards. So Stacy is, again, she's our treasurer, but she's also a sponsor. And she, uh, her company printed up these cards for us. So you can be a sponsor. Uh, for next year, we have some really innovative packages. Uh, a one-month sponsor is only $250, that's not bad, but you can also be a sponsor for longer periods. So next year we're trying to get uh, gold and platinum level sponsors if you want to sponsor for the year. This works really well. Um, LA2M has an email list that goes out to around 2,000 people, uh, qualified intelligent people around Southeast Michigan, like yourselves. Now uh, we have really high open rates, and um, if you are a sponsor you get promoted there, you also get promoted on our website, which does really well for your search engine rankings. and. You know, we're going to be creating nice sponsor profiles on our website, which really do show up high in the search engines. So uh, please look at the sponsor card if you're interested. Write your stuff down. You can hand it to me or Mary Lou Olds, who will be up here in a minute. Um, but we also, in addition to our sponsors, we, we kind of, we pass the hat. So we're, we're an old school organization. We don't have membership fees. It's free to come. Uh, but we pass the hat. So Stacy is going to pass the basket. Um, so we suggest if you could throw a few bucks in there, maybe a five. This helps fund us. Um, we're all volunteers, so Carter taking pictures is volunteer. Roger taking video every week, live streaming is volunteer. I'm volunteer, she's volunteer. We're all volunteer, so we need support. So Stacey's gonna pass that. Please contribute if you can. And, um, and you know, speaking of sponsors, Stacey's gonna keep you up here for a minute. But we have a sponsor, you may have noticed on that back sponsor table, there's some really cool stuff. There's some glow-in-the-dark things. And there's something big happening May 6th. Who knows what's happening on May 6th? Yes. Yes, the vote, right? So the, the question is, um, uh, the ride is actually going for vote on May 6th about helping with public transit, which I think is potentially a noble cause. But anyways, they're sponsoring, and they brought cool tchotchkes. And um, Don is a long-time sponsor in Carnegie Valley Town. So I'm going to let Don uh, from, from the ride speak, speak for a couple minutes. Here Hey everybody, good morning. I'm um, Don Klein from The Ride, and we're just asking everybody to come up May 6th. We're 13 short days away from uh, potentially improving our community from jobs, health, to uh, seniors, people with disabilities. Uh, we have 44% service improvements planned, 900,000 hours a year, and all that will only cost the average taxpayer about $1.35 a week. Uh, so it's a very small amount to improve the community in ways that uh, we haven't seen before. So we're just asking everybody to come out vote May 6th. And if you'd like more information, please visit theRideYourWay.org. Thanks. Thank you, Don. I keep waiting for the ride to offer space travel, but I'm sure that's coming. That's coming. Yeah, in addition to these Next village. space-powered buses that drive around town and help people out. So thank you, Don, for sponsoring. So uh, you can sponsor Don gets a nice banner in our email newsletter that goes out weekly. Um, and Don gets to talk about Alley to him and his, his business. So um, we also have a t-shirt, which we're, uh, Tim, we got a t-shirt to give you here. Stacey's Stace gonna, you want to go present the t-shirt over there, Tim? Um, Bank of Ann Arbor bought us Alley Tone t-shirts. We'd like to do a little photo out here. So Bank of Ann Arbor, the bank that helps bought us Alley Tone t-shirts, that's great. So we're open to suggestions if other people have cool sponsor ideas like that. Yeah. All right. See, it's such a big lens. Yes. He's got it. Okay, here we go. Alright. So what else? Um, a couple more things about LA Tone. We are on LinkedIn, we are on Facebook, we're on Twitter. There's tweets going on right now. 
Emily, who's an Agenix intern, this is her last LA2M, her last day. She is um, finishing her internship at Agenix. She's been doing a great job handling the Twitter for LA2M. So follow along with Emily on LA2M and hashtag LA2M. And uh, keep the buzz going about LA2M. Tell your friends, bring your friends, and join us online. Okay? So without further ado, uh, I'm going to introduce our speaker. This guy, uh, he comes to us from Cobasin, which is a really cool company. And Tim, maybe you can tell us a little bit about Cobasin, what you guys do. But he's going to be talking about B2B marketing. And uh, I don't know, without further ado, you ready? I'm ready. All right, Tim Boucher. Let's give him a round of applause. Thanks, everybody. Uh, I was told to stand under the light, so I'll try to stay in this spot if I can. Um, so CoVisit is just to follow up what Derek was saying. Um, we're a technology company. We've got about $100 million in business. Did an IPO last fall. Uh, about half the business is automotive, and we're doing things like if anyone has um, OnStar in their vehicle, CoVis is the technology behind the scenes that identifies the identities of you, which is your key fob and your car, and knows that you own a Cadillac, so, and it knows that your computer um, is yours, so that you can you know, manage everything about your vehicle, um, and your identity manager, it keeps it secure. Um, so that's basically the core of our company. It's a technology platform. The piece that I manage is I do the marketing. I'm the head of marketing for the healthcare division. We're about a third of the business, but we're the fastest growing part and I believe the most innovative, so, but my counterparts might argue about that, so we'll, well, I'm the only one here, so I get to say that. So, um, so anyway, uh, uh, three, uh, so a couple of points. So for the presentation, I just wanted to kind of introduce myself. I've been in marketing for 23 years, and uh, which is a long time. I've been, part of that's been uh, in a sales role, but I was always selling marketing stuff. And um, about half of my career I've been in automotive, and half my career I've been in healthcare. Uh, I've, I've worked in some other industries, it's all like office furniture manufacturing and banking and, and education. So I've marketed a lot of stuff and I've uh, picked up a few things through the years. And I, just from talking with a couple of people here, I know that um, some folks are in sales, some people have different kinds of businesses. Um, if I could, just by a show of hands, um, how many of you all um, work in business to business, whether you're marketing it or whether you're selling it? You might have a consumer solution, but you're selling it to uh, businesses. If you could just kind of raise your hands real high. Yeah, so I'd say the majority of the room, myself included. And um, what I'll say about my presentation is that um, if, we, if you do these three things, I think it'll make you much more relevant as you'll sell or market into the business to business environment. Things that I picked up over the years. Um, I created this presentation for you guys, and um, it's, it's not something that I do on a regular basis. So um, I'm, I'm here because uh, I think this is a great group. I haven't been here in probably five years. I think like I'm coming back to confession after a long time. And, you know, sorry, Derek, but thanks for inviting me. <laughs> and Derek invited me about nine months ago, and I remember last Wednesday because it was right on my calendar. So um, anyway, this is. Uh, um, I, I just, as a bit of additional bit of context, I'm actually um, finishing up my MBA at the University of Michigan, so I was a little bit of a late bloomer, but I, it really inspires me. And in fact, it's inspired a, a bit of the content of the presentation here, so I'll be finishing up in December. So with that, I'll start moving ahead here. So it's an easy agenda. So the first point is just the, the free marketing uh, truths as, as I see them, and, and one is, um, I think if you align your pitch to these three truths, you'll, you'll have some good success in, in selling into the B2B space. So that's my, my reason or my, my argument for why this is important for you, why you're sitting here, and, and hopefully how I can help you. Um, I'll have a few tips at the end. One of the things that Mary Lou told me was that what some of what you all are getting, wanting to get out of this is how do I sell better into the B2B space? And, I think with um, half my career being uh, on the agency side and half my career being on the client side, I've spent the last 14 years on the client side of the business, I, I think I have a bit of a unique perspective on, on how it, we like to be sold to because I was trying to do it the first half of my career um, and I've been on the receiving end of it the second half of my career and I, I, I have some perspective and that's part of what these insights are based on as well. Okay, so truth number one. Um, I believe we've entered the next generation of marketing innovation. 
And the, there's a couple of points under this truth that I have. The first is that marketers can use big data now to drive innovation. And that's something that's kind of new, and I've got a, a slide after this that kind of explains what I mean, and there's actually an example which um, um, actually Christina, my friend here, might recognize because I pulled it from our former employer, which is about seven years ago, but I think the, the statute of limitations has passed on it, and I won't get in trouble. <laughs> it's, it's private data, but I actually, if I send this deck to anyone, I'll have to take that information out. Um, and then the second point is that you know, identifying, there's a lot of um, um, talk about buyer personas, there's a lot of talk about, you know, you need to identify um, your, your end customer's pain point and all that. Really, truly though, that's only the beginning point, and I'll show you an example from my current employer about what we're doing and the complexities and how simple I think, you know, the answer needs to be to actually make this out. So, um, so big data, I do believe, drives marketing innovation, but I also believe that the devil's in the details. And you really need to start with the end in mind. And because if you don't design the campaign or the sales pitch with the idea that you're gonna measure what you do and improve it over time, um, you won't build in the type of sophistication in your campaign and take the time to be thoughtful about it. It, it forces a level of discipline because it forces you to be very concrete and black and white about how am I gonna measure this? And if I know that, then um, it, it sort of forces you, it's sort of your north star as you go through the process, is everything in support of that objective. So the devil truly is in the details though. And it takes discipline. So at this, um, uh, when I, I, I was applying here, and I won't say what business it is because we don't want to give away their, their private information any more than I already am. Um, <laughs> but, um, so we were measuring, we're literally measuring all the direct marketing types, and I literally copied and, and, and scanned this in. So like direct mail, um, we spent $199,000 that year, we generated this many leads, 6,881. Do you see this, that's the specificity here. Um, a lot of work. This created 265 consultations with the doctors. Um, so we measured the percentage of close rate from lead to consultation. And we said, okay, so a consultation costs $751 for direct mail, that's pretty good. Um, it translates into 66 actual surgeries. So these are literally a scalpel cutting into a human being, right? It's a surgery that resulted from that direct mail piece. So it's pretty good in terms of the specificity and what we can measure. Um, it's $3,000 per scalpel cut for every you know, um, surgery. So okay, it's pretty good and we measured things, some things were free, some events, some things were just other, but you know, like email was um, higher cost per lead. And I mean, if you're um, kind of a, a little bit of a data geek like I am, this, this stuff kind of gets you excited and it's like, I, I, I'm amazed that I, we could measure this kind of stuff at this level. So we know, um, we were tracking down to the area of the email that they would click on and we can track the cost per surgery based on you clicked on the header versus you clicked on a link inside the email. So we were, we were really nerding out on some of this stuff which was kind of interesting and cool. But you, the key is not just for the sake of being a nerd but for the sake of like actually learning and applying this uh, as you go through the process. And print, so um, print publications, magazines, um, Parade USA Today, that kind of thing. Uh, a little bit more expensive than the direct mail, and then we compared. Um, we started looking at some other areas, and this is where I talk about innovation. Um, we were always doing TV. TV when I started, we were doing basically TV and print as the primary two things. You can see here like the costs were relatively high, a lot of volume. You know, so there's a lot of inventory available, and uh, we could drive consultations. We were finding our audience, but it was kind of expensive. And it was getting more and more expensive over time. We were finding it wasn't a scalable business model that we could grow and ramp up over time. And the, the, the CEO of our firm wanted to grow our business at double digit growth every year. And what we ended up doing is, and I think this had a large part to do with it, we ended up growing from 65 million to about 240 million in about four years. We went from two hospitals to six hospitals. And I believe a lot of it had to do with the marketing programs we put in place. And a lot of it had to do with the devils in the details, measuring and optimizing over time how we were doing what we're doing down to this very microscopic level. And one of the things you see here at the bottom is kind of an aha. And that is the, this, this web, sort of seemingly innocuous web internet category. Wow, how do you generate leads at $4.82 a piece? And 
This is actually the only part of my presentation that's digital, and um, which is surprising for most people that know me because I love digital marketing. I do a ton of digital marketing. I was doing paid search before um, you know Yahoo was taking over Overture, and then Yahoo went away, and now Bing is growing, and Google. I love this stuff, but um, I'm not going to I'm not going to nerd out on that stuff for this presentation. I'm going to stay mostly offline. But um, in this case, we found some online channels and websites that could generate leads to us, and we're, we started paying per lead for those. And we also started optimizing the banner ads, and part of the secret sauce was to find websites where we could um, actually profile the folks on the website and only serve up the ads to people that met our, met our target profile. And then on a paper lead, we started optimizing that and saying, okay, we're only gonna pay for the leads where people fill out all the categories in the online form. So we're not gonna pay for partial leads anymore. And so by optimizing this over time, um, what we ended up doing is taking, um, and this wasn't even the, the most wasteful year, it, there was a lot of waste going on here when we started measuring this stuff. We took $3 million out of TV, we put a million dollars into digital marketing, and we doubled the business the next year. So that was kind of the, the end news story in this. So the insight here, the takeaway, and I'll repeat these at the end, is finding the best place to spend your next marketing dollar requires a strategy at the very front end for measuring what you do and then the discipline to actually look back and spend the time and invest the time so that you can improve on the back end. Um, the next point, um, and again, I'm kind of referring back, I said there's two points under this, um, you know, this next generation of marketing innovation. So the second point was this identifying your buyer personas and understanding your customer's uh, pain is only the first step. So this one is an example of um, we spent a lot of time, this is my current company at Hobbiton, so in healthcare, part of what we do in healthcare is we understand the, and help facilitate communication among hospitals to physicians, hospitals to physician groups, um, all sorts of entities like skilled nursing facilities and rehab clinics. We do all the, the interconnectivity of all that stuff. If someone needs to refer someone out to a different facility, we provide the digital um, applications that make that transfer happen. So it's, it's, it's very technology based, it's automating healthcare, we're part of the solution of making things cheaper in healthcare. So it's a good thing. Um, but you can imagine uh, there's a lot of infrastructure in place in the healthcare system, there's a lot of inertia towards doing this and reaching your target buyer making the sale, making a chief medical officer or a chief information officer get it and buy your solution is a complex sale. It's a, it's a very considered purchase. It happens over a period of time and it's, um, it's not simple. And finding them, you don't find them all in one place. It's a very highly educated market. Um, so they don't respond to the typical um, simple messages. So. Um, so, but we created this map, and we, our, our salespeople actually use this today. So, explaining, there's a there's a whole narrative which I won't tell, but you know, it's a story about Charlie, and as Charlie goes through the system, and I think this is good. I mean, we clearly understand our our target customer. We clearly understand our buyer and the pain points that they have. And the short story here is that poor Charlie, um, you know, uh, ended up like getting readmitted back in the hospital because they couldn't share the information. And so. You know, we're the heroes and we saw this. This thing animates, we, we build it over, you know, as we sell it. But we understand the sales process. But what we were missing with this as we first developed it was, so what? So what's the urgency? Why do I need to buy your solution? I've got this EMR thing and it's, you know, it's pretty cool and everyone's got one and we spent $20 million building it. It's gotta do everything I need. And the truth is that it, it doesn't. And I'm gonna play a short video, which I think you'll find entertaining and it's going to kind of help make this point. And it's from the Wall, this Wall Street. Let so me go to the right spot. Every person who runs. It's about. Don't even sell that. Okay. It's about identifying what it is that, um, how to make the sale and crystallizing this point. So if anyone's seen this, I think you'll find this entertaining. If you haven't seen it, um, there's a little bit of vulgar language in here, so I'm going to apologize in advance. Is anybody offended by vulgar language? <laughs> All right, good. Let me know. I can't stop it now. Okay. Machine first I need. Brad, show them how it's done. Boom. Send me that pen. Watch. Go on. Okay, so this fucking pen? That's my boy right there. This pen. Fuck us all everything. Would you do me a favor? Write your name down on that napkin for me. I don't have a pen. Exactly. Supply the name. You know what I'm saying? It's creating urgency. Yeah. They're getting the one to buy the stuff. Instantly something that they need. You know what I mean? That's a pen. 
All nuns are lesbians. Okay, we didn't hear that. That had, that had nothing to do with my presentation. <laughs> the first part did. So I think you get it. I, I, I love that. I just saw this last week. I love that quote. I see it. It's, it's terrific. And it's, you know, you know, put your name on this piece of paper. You know, I mean, give me a pen. I need a pen. What do they need here? They didn't need this map. They didn't need to solve everything. They needed a discharge packet to get the information out to the case manager so they can solve their problem. When we started selling that when they needed it, the thing started selling like hotcakes. And so there's a lot of complexity and sophistication that you can build into your marketing communications. And, and sometimes you're clouding the issue. Sometimes you're giving them too much information. And sometimes you really just need to sell them a pen because they really need to write their, their, their signature on a piece of paper. So that's my idea there. So that's the, the so the second truth is that I believe marketers need to explore new options, and, and this one actually relates to my MBA experience. So I was um, I was amazed that this first one up here was a study that uh, I'm in accounting class, go figure. Which I, I my third one is like um, stabbing my needle, my eyes open needles. I mean, it's, I I don't like accounting. I'll just say that, and I apologize to any accountants in the room. But this is a great accounting class, and. Um, we have a, uh, we did read the study and they, they showed that NASCAR sponsorships, and, and I had no idea, believe me, um, and, and I guess before I go into this, if we could do the hand thing one more time, how many people believe that NASCAR might be one of the best forms of marketing to consumers? Okay, less than the B2B count, but I'd say about 40%. Um, I didn't think so. I would have been one of those people that kept my hands down and kept eating my salad. Um, I, I didn't believe, and, and it's interesting because my father-in-law um, has worked in motorsports his whole career. He's like, he's from in, in Indianapolis. Um, he, would, he would literally, back in the day, like tape a NASCAR race and play it back later so he could watch it. And um, I, would even, I can't even watch it when I'm there. Like, so I, 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 it's, not, it's just not that interesting to me, so, unless there's a crash, I guess. So anyway, the, the fact that um, I saw this thing and said, you know, really, you know, they, the, the, the conclusion of this study, and this, you know, some, some, some brilliant statisticians put together this study, and they measured the impact of a sponsorship, the immediate impact on day zero and day one of a sponsorship of NASCAR. What does that do to your stock price? And what they found was that it immediately goes up in value on average for these Fortune 500 type companies, on average, $300 million for a non-automotive firm and $500 million plus for an automotive firm. I'm, I actually just finished the, the final on Monday for this class. Like, I, we, we just learned this. I'm like, this is amazing to me. And the, the study said it's possible that no other single marketing program in history has driven larger stock price in, increases. And there's really no reason for me showing Will Ferrell here. This is just sort of like gratuitous stuff that's kind of fun. Um, but, but so I did my actual, so we had a group project that I, I said, guys, let's, let's focus on this. This is really interesting to me. So we, we did it on NASCAR, and some of the things we found out were amazing. And I did interview my father-in-law and actually some of the people in racing and learned some things about it that really opened my eyes. And I guess sort of, um, I had some prejudices against it, to be honest. And I just thought, you know, it's, it's kind of southeast. It's, it's really not the demographic I'd ever want to market to. I mean, usually with my customers are looking for more affluent and um, more, at least national, you know, it seems like it's very much like um, small niches or pockets. but. Um, you know, there's some things about it, and this is one of the insights that I didn't really fully understand about NASCAR is that 80% of the fans understand that the drivers couldn't run their cars without the sponsors. So they literally attribute, they, they may love, you know, Dodge or Chevrolet or Toyota, they may love Dale Earnhardt or um, whoever those guys are, Dick Trickle and, you know, um, whatever, Dale Earnhardt Jr., they may love those guys, and, and they want to see them race. And they knew without Tide or Cheerios or General Mills or Pillsbury or whoever is sponsoring that car, my guy can't race. And that's all they need to know. And darn it, I'm going to buy Tide at the grocery store. And they literally do this. I mean, it's really, it's the only sport where the, the logo on, is, on, is part of the, the whole um, equation. It couldn't be shown in the market without it. I mean, so... Um, Here's one example, and I thought this was fascinating as we did our research. Um, does anyone remember Zest, the soap? I mean, I remember when I was a kid, I hadn't seen it for like 20 years, I, I thought it went out away. It's a Procter & Gamble brand. Uh, it was actually declining in double digits for 
years, I think probably since I was a kid, and that's why you haven't seen it. And um, it's getting taken off the shelves. And um, so this High Ridge Brands um, company bought Zest, and what High Ridge does is they buy sort of troubled consumer brands, and then they they use brilliant marketing or something to turn the brand around. And what they did, the only thing they did different is they started using NASCAR as a way to promote their brand. And I mean, you can see like this this same horribly ugly greenish blue color, it's on the car, I mean, it, it's still on the soap. They didn't change that, they didn't change the logo, they didn't create a great tagline, they just started using NASCAR. And you can see by the numbers, Zest sales grew by 42% last year after double digit sales declines in, for years and years. And you look at the, the competition, I also didn't know, I guess I don't study soap, Irish Spring is the most popular, that's kind of interesting, I didn't have no idea. But, but everyone else is declining. And um, in last year, and it wasn't a great year for soap, or maybe uh, Zest is sort of like um, cleaning up on the competition, if you will. So I thought it was interesting. So uh, more evidence. Um, they have an incredibly loyal, you know, fan base, which is part of, to my earlier point. You know, 60% of them feel good about the sponsors. 50% of them speak positively about the brands. 33% they say they always buy that brand. And, which is interesting, and a third say they always participate in their promotions. And I know as a, as a marketer, if, if my customers or prospects would say that, um, I would be ecstatic. So I mean, that's, that's really amazing. I also didn't know that about 125 of the Fortune 500 uses NASCAR as a part of their marketing mix. So um, it's really more prevalent. Oops. Is that my fault there? <laughs> Okay. I'm going to try and not touch anything. We'll see if that works. <laughs> um, so the insight here is that marketers need to explore uh, new options. And um, I've got a video that has nothing to do with my story, so I won't play it now, but um, I might both play it later. Um, the third truth is that uh, uncovering trends that create a need you can solve. And the example I'm going to use here is um, the Affordable Care Act's impact on health plans. And so this is a little bit of a, um, a health care uh, issue, but it's Obamacare. And what it's done is, you can imagine, companies that were not selling B2B in the past, um, or, not selling, or that were selling B2B like health plans, typically health plans have made their living by selling, um, by selling to employers. That's, that's, they, by signing on companies like Ford and GM and Caterpillar and Google and places with large uh, workforces, they, that's their market. That's where they spend their energy. Those are the people that have the, the power within the health plans are the people that are making, selling to these national accounts. So what Obamacare did is it kind of turned that a little bit on its ear and said, okay guys, now we're gonna open up these individual exchanges and people get to sign up um, on the individual exchanges for their own health insurance. And they're bringing a lot of people into the system that were previously uninsured. But what's happening is a lot of employers are actually dropping their coverage and saying, okay, employees, here's 3,000 bucks. Good luck, go buy it yourself. And that's happening. And it's just part of, by design, it's one half of the system. And what it's done for health plans is it's, it's literally turned them upside down and said, okay, marketing team, we need to market to consumers now. And you can imagine if someone said that to your business, if your business was, business model was based on selling to businesses, you had a massive sales force, your marketing team is mostly a sales enablement function. It's really not a function of you know, innovating, creating new products, and marketing to consumers. It has really um, changed their world. And that's what some of the quotes and some of my former clients have told me. So um, I know a woman who's the head of marketing and, and, and product management at Coventry. Coventry has 14 health plans. Um, they're a pretty big health plan. Um, and she said, Tim, you know, with the shift in selling to individual consumers, actually, marketing is suddenly relevant at the health plan. I, I get to sit at the big kids' table now. I get to go to the board meetings. They want to hear what I have to say. In fact, I'm on the spot. I need to have a solution for them because this is something that we have to solve. And a lot of our business in the future is going to come from selling to consumers as opposed to just selling to these large employer groups. Um, Kaiser Permanente, so one of the their... Um, they're called an integrated delivery network. They have they own the health plan, they own the hospitals, they own the surgeons and the, and the physicians. They kind of own everything up and down, most of California. But they traditionally haven't marketed directly to the consumers. So again, it's, it's 
Um, and, and for them, um, in talking to an executive out there, she told me basically a third of our business by the year 2016 is going to churn every year, meaning a third of it's going to go away. And guess what, marketing team? Find us a new, more than a third, we want to grow this business. Find us more consumers than we lost this year. You know, so, and it's going to be a huge portion of our business. If they don't do that effectively, they're going to down, downsize dramatically. So they need to figure out the next couple of years. And I think as many of the people in this room know, the talent that they have in their marketing departments, that's not what they've done their entire career. They've got people, tremendous people. Kaiser's done a tremendous job of retaining their employees. They're, they're known for this as one of the best employers to work for in the United States. You go there and you stay there for the rest of your career. Well, that's a problem if you have people who have been at Kaiser in your marketing department for 5, 10, 15, 20, 25 years in this B2B model. There's a lot of cultural inertia towards changing over and marketing to consumers. And that's why I would make the argument to you all, if you're, a, if you're a consultant, if you're an ad agency, if you're a digital agency, if you sell mobile ad space, whatever you do, um, there's an opportunity for you here in this market. Um, the last point I have is from uh, PwC, the consulting firm. And PwC says that by um, 2016, there'll be 22 million consumers in the US who are buying 240 uh, billion with a B in services online through these individual exchanges. So it's it's not a small market; it's a huge market. And health plans will uh, win or lose, succeed or fail, uh, be consumed or um, consume others based on their ability, in part, to capitalize on the consumer market. So they've got a huge marketing challenge that they need to solve, and they, in many cases, have not wrapped their heads around it. Another one is WellPoint. Um, WellPoint's the largest health plan in the United States. They have 44 million members um, based in Indianapolis. Uh, WellPoint basically laid off their entire marketing department and said, we need new people. You, you people don't get it. And they brought in new people there. So they're, they're, they're a little bit more ruthless in how they're trying to solve this problem. Um, it remains to be seen whether or not that approach is the best approach or not. And um, all this is not to say that everyone in this room ought to go after the health plan market. I'm just saying that this is just an example of a trend that I think is creating a need that marketing people can solve. Whether you were to go work for one of them or whether you were to um, be an agency and support one of them, I think there's a, a pressing need. There's something that has to happen. Um, we're at COVISIT. We're looking at the, uh, the Medicaid agencies. Um, we're working closely with, right now, with Oregon, Colorado, and Michigan, and we're saying, you know, um, it, it's part of, again, it's Obamacare, and it's, you know, okay, so Medicare is gonna suddenly um, cover, uh, Medicaid is gonna cover um, people who didn't have insurance before. Great, I, I, I'm fully supportive of that, and okay, states, you know, you need to cover this. Great, okay, fine. But the problem is they were already underwater and they weren't exactly covering the existing population, so the tax base wasn't covering that exactly. So now they need to cover this influx of new patients and more good news, these people are less healthy than the people you have in the system already. And, and more good news, they actually don't know how to use the healthcare system. They're, they're just gonna go to the ER and they don't really have a primary care doc, so good luck, you know. And that's facing these states right now. So we have, in our case, We've defined a pressing business issue that these Medicaid agencies are, are dying. Like they, they don't know what to do. And this is a problem. They need to take, you know, five to seven percent um, out of their system of costs on an annual basis over the next three or four years. And uh, where they're going to all face sort of unprecedented crisis at each state level. So like there's a pressing need. We're, we're working very closely on legislation and, and the technology systems behind the scenes to actually help them reduce the cost of care, take costs out of the system, streamline their workflows so it takes less time. Um, and um, you know, so that's that's the, the trend that we're looking at. I'm just doing a time check here. Would you okay, Darren? What time? Okay, what time? I'm doing good. So the, the insight here on this third one is that marketers need to explore the broad industry trends that create pain that they can actually address. Go. Good timing, so we're going to recap. The, um, so the point number one, if you took nothing else away, was um, um, use the big data to find the best place to spend your next marketing dollar. Um, point number two was to create urgency and the need for your product, so selling that pen. Um, the third is to create, explore new and unanticipated options. I really did not believe in NASCAR. I, I really 
thought my father-in-law was lucky to have a job at Ford. I don't know what he was doing. And I think, actually, I see more value in it now. Um, and, and, but that's, NASCAR is just one option. Again, I don't think everyone in the room should be necessarily putting NASCAR into their media mix. But it's something to think about. You know, and there's probably things that you've written off. There's probably biases that you may have about different modalities of marketing that are truly viable. And if there's huge amounts of money being spent on something, there's probably a business case behind it. And there's probably things that you don't understand. And I think the fourth is to uncover trends that create a need um, that you can sell into. Um, this was the, the, the added bonus material. So people were looking for how can I sell into business to business clients like me. I would say, first of all, align your pitch with one of these three truths. It doesn't have to be obviously the example that I provided, but um, you know, I think that um, if I were to think about it, am I solving a problem for my client that this truly has some urgency? Do I have a solution? Have I thought it through so that I can provide something that actually is going to take, let them, allow them to sleep better at night? Um, things like that. Is it unique? Is it something that I can actually accomplish? Um, I would say build social connectedness <laughs> unobtrusively. Um, I can't count the number of um, invitations I get through LinkedIn where not only are they connecting me, but it's, it's an invitation to connect, and it's, it's a sales pitch at the same time. Um, I don't think most clients like that. I don't think they accept that. And I, I usually respond back that, you know, I'm glad to accept their invitation, but, you know, this is my personal networking space. I feel a personal connection with, um, with everyone that I'm connected with, and I, I have 1,200 connections, but it's like um, I, I feel connected to those people. I know them. I met them at a lunch. I met them. I worked with them or something. And uh, you need to build some equity with the person before you hit them with the sales pitch. And I think people feel, not as much as they do about Facebook, but I think LinkedIn, they still feel a sense of privacy and um, sort of intimacy with that relationship with who they're connected with. And it's not just a, um, open grounds for selling. Um, and I'd say um, do your homework before you present is another thing. I think that people appreciate that. It shows respect. Um, one tip I would have is read the CEO's letter and the annual report. Like we're um, presenting to um, HCA in a few weeks, and it's one of the largest hospital systems in America. And um, I brought the CEO letter to the sales team. I said, guys, have you read this? Like this is not what we're saying. Like you know, we we think we know what their strategy is. This is what their CEO said last month. Is their strategy for their organization? So. If your guy isn't telling you that, he's not aligned with the CEO. So we need to at least take this into consideration and, and say if they say that they're transforming these, their business in these ways, we probably need to address how they're transforming their business. And you know, I don't think they're making things up. I think the uh, annual report is, is valid. I think if the CEO puts his name at the bottom of it, he probably believes passionately in what he's saying. Um, the don'ts are to um, use LinkedIn as a spam engine, which I just mentioned. Um, I think mass email. It, especially if you're selling to someone who's a buyer of marketing and advertising solutions and services, uh, we're, we're all too savvy. We all know about the amount of effort that it took to click on that send button to 5,000 people. And I think a, a non-personalized message today on email is, is the equivalent of getting that old you know, direct mail piece 10, 15 years ago, which had bulk mail stamped in the upper right-hand corner. And nobody even took the time to press a stamp on the mailer. It's kind of the same thing. I think you're going to get about the same amount of receptivity to that. And I think, you know, book says never lose your never lose your professionalism. So never make typos would be one. <laughs> um, but never lose your professionalism, and, it, and that's it, I think happens sometimes. People will say, "I called you three times. This is the last time I'm going to call you." Like, good, you know, don't don't call again. <laughs> I ignored you on purpose the first two times. You don't have a, you didn't bring me something I didn't have before. So um, that's enough. So with that, I'll turn it over to questions. Who's got, a, who's got a question? Raise your hand and bring your mic down. Hi, I'm Tasha Moore with MPRG, and I was just curious if you could only choose two modes of marketing, what would they be and why in your current position? <coughs> that's a great that's a great question. Um, my current position, um, I'd say the, the two best things that we've done is, um, and I actually didn't even put it up on the slides, I, I thought about this afterwards. Um, the best thing I think we did last year was we actually did a a research study and that was a, a combination of a research study and a lead generation effort. And um, it, was, uh, it was a company called Porter Research, and they're great at this. Um, so, they, so we got the research, and, and we surveyed hospital executives and said, what are your, we asked them like 50 questions, a lot of questions. But at the same time, 
you know, by answering those questions, they told us what they're in the market for, they told us their purchase time frame, they told us the competitors they're looking at, they told us um, what they thought of our solutions, who's top of mind. We got a market study, we got a competitive study, we got an in-market study, and guess what? Our salespeople went after them as the leads were coming in. We called them leads. You know? And then at the end of the study, we got a great insight. We, we, one of the insights was that the CIO said that the cloud-based technology has reached the tipping point which was new, like six months prior, it did not hit the tipping point, but last June it hit the tipping point, and 60% of the CIO said, I now trust the cloud to hold personal, private, PHI, whatever you call it, patient data, and we, we, we did it great, we did a press release, and it got picked up by 14 publications, including Wall Street and Forbes, and, um, and then we had collateral to come out after it, we did presentations and webinars, it was like the gift that kept on giving, and, and that's why, I would say that was number one, first and foremost, and we'll do it again, we'll refresh it again this year, because um, it's that synergistic effect of something that gave us thought leadership material, drove our sales efforts, um, noteworthy news release, and drove our sales funnel, all at the same time for minimal effort. How, how often do you see analytics causing a paradigm shift in marketing strategies? So taking the data that, the big data that you talked about to begin with, how often do companies maybe, number one, either ignore it or, you know, accept it and, and embrace it? Yeah, so it's, it's a great question. I, I think that, um, I, I'd like to say it's 50-50. I think it's less than that, honestly. I mean, I, and that's the good news with me having worked at a couple of different places. I've seen uh, where it's been adopted and where it's been ignored, or I, I think there's a, it's the culture of the executive team at the company. And some people have a level of tolerance for complexity that they say, okay, this is the, the level I will tolerate and I don't believe you're gonna gain any more um, benefit by, uh, I think there's a point of diminishing returns. And I think part of what I'm saying is you need to go past that perceived point of diminishing returns and, and get really anal with this stuff and really dig into the detail and be disciplined over time about applying those insights and that's where you find the true gain, and, and I think there's a, I think they stop too soon. So I'd say probably 90% doesn't apply the insights from big data. Do you, do you think it's fair? Um, I think they're they're applying the Jack Welch rule. I think they're they're saying that I got 90% of the information. I'm not going to gain that much by getting 95% of the information. I need to make this business decision. That's a very common, I think, executive belief. And I, I don't think that, I, I think they're missing something. I think it's the, I, I, would, I believe it's the marketing role to press on and find that insight beyond which they have a tolerance for. Okay, time for one more question. Who's got a question? All right, I have one. Okay. Um, I'm just curious, about, I love the NASCAR idea. And I, I thought that was a really interesting study. Yeah. Um, how much does it cost to get, in, get into NASCAR? I mean, it's not cheap, right, to get into NASCAR marketing? Yeah, you're, you're talking, um, you, you really, you know, it's interesting. Um, I actually got a proposal for IndyCar a couple weeks ago from somebody just off the cuff. And um, I, because you're a digital guy, you'll get this. I, I literally had him on the phone. I said, Art, let's pull up Google Trends. And he said, great, this is fun. I said, yeah, put in, put in uh, Indianapolis 500 on Google Trends. I said, okay, now let's click on the button, put in NASCAR. Um, Indianapolis 500 was nothing, except it spiked once a year. NASCAR was up here, and I said, okay, you want to sell me a program for IndyCar that's $500,000 for a one event in Detroit, and it's in six weeks. And okay, you know, you got no audience, basically. And just as a comparison, you know, NASCAR has got this. I don't think you, I, I think you'd have to spend, though, you have to have someone with a, a, a sizable budget, but, you know, actually my, my father works for a consulting firm right now, and his, his point is, he can find value in a $10,000 investment, and some of the things that people don't know is, you can take a car, General Mills used to do this, they actually didn't have a car, that raced around the track, but there was a car with a General Mills decal on it, and Cheerios decal on it, and that's, I remember like, I'm like, no Sam, that's a real car, he goes, yeah, it's a real car, it never raced at, at that time. They were just using it, and there's no, there's no law saying you can't stick a logo on a, on a stock car. And so they drive it around, they put it in parking lots, they have actual drivers be there, but they didn't spend the million dollars on sponsoring a driver. 
And so there's other things you can do. Like you have to know that again, the devil's in the details. You need to know that the the, the prime space is actually on the dashboard inside the car. If you can get your URL logo there, that's where the camera points when they're looking at the driver during the race. You'll get more exposures there than being on a bumper, um, maybe not the hood, but by being on, on any of the bumpers of the car. So like there's there's different things that I had no idea as I dug into this of ways to do it, but he'll literally tell you, I mean, if you're interested, like I'll, I'll give you his contact information. Because uh, that's his, his thought is like, he's like, I should come and present these guys, you know, in Ann Arbor because he said, I can help you find value in $10,000, $50,000 or a million dollars, and there's a lot of people that don't understand it. Okay. No, we'd love to have him come speak. If you want yeah. to make that referral, then I will. Right. Absolutely. But, uh, hey, let's give Tim Boucher a big round of applause. Good push. Good push. That's okay. Tim Bush. Bush. <laughs> no it's Tim Bush. Like Bush Racing Team. That's right. Yeah. But uh, what a great talk. Who enjoyed that? You guys learned something? Yeah, that was fabulous. Fabulous. Wonderful. I love how you distilled it down into three points, and they were all really, really good points. So, um, anyways, Tim Bush, thank you for doing that. Thanks, sir. So, now we get to go around the room and introduce ourselves. And if you would please stand up and uh, project, and then say a couple words by yourself, and then pass the mic, and we'll get all the way around, around the room by one o'clock. And we're going to start up front here today. Hi everyone, thanks for coming. This, this is a, a really good group and I'm, I'm just pleased to have everyone here. Uh, thanks Tim, that was a uh, oh, very good Hi. Thanks, thanks, that was an outstanding talk. Oh, and thank you so much. Informative. A lot of really good information. Really, really glad you came to talk to our group. Thanks for um, And I'm Mary Lou, I'm with LA2M. If you have any questions about speaking or about being a sponsor, um, um, please talk with me, I'll be right up here. And also, um, I am a freelance writer for online content and social media. Um, if your company is in need of those services, please let me know. Hi everybody, uh, I'm Keith Vandenbush. Uh, I'm with FTC and H Engineering. We're a uh, environmental, civil, and uh, architectural engineering firm. We do a lot of work in the Ann Arbor area for streetscapes and U of M and everything like that. And I manage the business development and marketing program. Well, I'm Tim Brisley. I work in the area of personal finance, teach people the things that banks, insurance companies, credit card companies, mortgage companies don't want people to know because they put them out of business. Hi, I'm Laura Kirshner with Nugenix Digital Marketing. And um, I really enjoyed the little snippet of digital that you talked about. Great insights. Um, we focus a lot on inbound marketing, which helps clients um, drive uh, traffic to their websites and generate leads. I'm Greg Wilson. I'm a local uh, freelance digital marketer with the history of public relations as well. Hi, everybody. My name is. Is this on? Yeah. Did you just turn it off? My name is Robin Pierman, and I am with Social Engagements. Uh, I am a social networking teacher and coach. I help businesses establish their own social networking and do their management for those who do not want to outsource it to a marketing team. Oh. Oh, hey. Here I am, I'm Bill Hall, just like walk down the hall. I have Icon Videography, corporate events and presentations, and I'm here to shadow Mr. Roger. Yeah, I'm Roger Rail, I'm a venture catalyst and I help with a lot of the networking groups and found doing a lot of live streaming recording to video and data mashups, Google Earth mashups. Uh, Bill's going to sub for me next week because I'll be doing a gig somewhere else. So. Um, What's coming up? Uh, anyway, that's enough for now. Hi, I'm Ann Hansen. I'm in uh, consumer marketing with product goods. Right now, I am director of marketing and innovation for PetMate. We make products, everything from kennels to collars and toys. Um, work tends to take me out of uh, Ann Arbor, so it's good to be with you. Hi, I'm Al Parcher, owner and president of Alpac Inc., a software development company and IT consulting company in Ann Arbor. I'm Jeff Bates. I'm with All Star Alarm Company. We're up in Whitmore Lake. Uh, we do residential and commercial uh, alarm systems. I'm here just to learn how to better market it in our business. My name is Jennifer Downham with Ann Arbor State Bank. I'm the electronic banking officer. I work with commercial and personal customers. 
Hi, I'm Peggy Backley. I'm a Chief Operating Officer with Denver State Bank. Hi, I'm Don Gilkey with Laban Lipstrap. We're a small entrepreneurial company that manufactures specialty straps that help patients that need safe and secure limb suspension. And I used to be in the world that Tim was in. I'm well aware with Cognizant. And I looked at how can you scale down his ideas. There are, there are some good possibilities there. So I really appreciate him coming. I can't invest a million dollars. But there are things that you can do. And if you're not using analytics for your website, but when you're doing conferences to see what traffic's coming for your YouTube videos, I highly suggest you do it. Google gives free classes, and I'm not a shill for Google, but this is how we measure our return on investment. Hi, my name is Jordan. I work uh, for Dexter Builders, and I'm just here to plug one last time the uh, tour of remodeled homes this weekend. We're going to be one of 10 uh, remodelers that's featured on the Ann Arbor and the Plymouth area. So if you guys want any more information, you can go to the NARI website, or you can come talk to me. We have uh, some free tickets still available. Come look at a bunch of different remodeled homes, kitchens, bathrooms. Get a first-hand look at us, plus nine other really great mo uh, remodelers from around the uh, Ann Arbor Plymouth area. Hey everybody, Don Klein again from The Ride. Uh, we have a need and an urgency here in uh, our communities. Seniors can't get to the places they need. Uh, disabled people can't get to the places they need. Students can't get to school. Uh, we have unemployment. Things are getting better, but we uh, have a solution at The Ride uh, to propose improvement to our public transportation system. So ask that you come out and vote May 6th, however you'd like. And for more information, theride.org, we'll come back to the table, grab one of these cool little flash bands, uh, a button, or some pamphlets if you're interested in learning more about how we're uh, planning to improve our communities. Um, hi, I'm Daniela. I'm in digital marketing and advertising. I work with Liquor.com, which is a leading publication on mixology, um, spirits, cocktails, and cocktail culture. I am the director of client services, and we help our clients um, mainly focus on advertising sales and help our clients build and implement uh, advertising campaigns to reach the target markets. Hi, I'm Karen Tuttle, and I'm with Kleisa Design. We create honestly beautiful design, which includes websites and print design. Hi, I'm uh, Tom Bobney. I'm with Mobile Exhibit Specialists. Uh, I do the NASCAR trailers, so if you want to know something about pricing. <laughs> but uh, today I just thought I'd mention uh, Nathan's Coney Island out of New York, new client for me. Very excited. We'll be at five NASCAR tracks and uh, buy hot dogs for one of my clients. Hi everybody, I'm Stacey from Dollarville, your local digital print shop. We print things fast and cost effective. Hi, my name is Jennifer Zumber. I'm a naturopath and a nutrition response test practitioner. I work up on Liberty and Way Nutritional <coughs> Healing Center of Ann Arbor, and I also do wellness speaking. Um, I have my own business called Food First by Jennifer, where I educate companies and associations about how to be healthier. I'm also kind of looking for an intern, so if anyone knows anyone to do social media for me, because I'm split. Um, I also do this in Lansing two days a week, and then here two days a week, and then I have my other business. So I would look to want to hire someone for, or do an internship for our social media. Hi, I'm Mario Papa at the Ann Magazine. We are um, an insert into the New York Times, Wall Street Journal, and the Ann Arbor News once a month, and we are also online. Um, we have a delightful new website, so go to it. Find the designs did this fabulous ad for A2 Wellness Collective at the last minute and did a brilliant job. Thank you very much, Karen. And I'm also here to say that the Indie Awards is coming up in uh, the July issue of the Ann, and we're working with Think Local First, so it is time to nominate businesses for the Think Local First Indie Award, the Ann Spectacular, whatever. <laughs> Hi, I'm Todd White. Um, I work for the University of Michigan uh, at Merit Network. We're the uh, internet service provider for the university as well as most public institutions across the state of Michigan. Tim, I too am a, a late bloomer, a recent grad of the MBA program here at the University of Michigan, and I'm just looking to sort of find a way to transition a bit out of software development and more into marketing and other areas related. Hi, I'm Tasha Moore with Martopia, which is a strategic marketing and public relations firm. We provide 
business to business services, namely in the financial services technology and healthcare technology space, as well as uh, working for some clients who do consumer uh, based products and services. Hi, I'm Ashley Mo. Um, I'm the marketing specialist at MessageBox, where I started building an online platform for event planners. So, you know, event planners, please come talk to me. Hi, I'm Deb Rakovich. I'm with United Way of Washington County. We connect people, resources, and organizations together to create a thriving community for everyone. Uh, we are having our annual meeting on Tuesday. If anybody would like to know more about United Way, I'd love to have you come to our website and sign up. It's pretty easy, uwgive.org. Thanks. Hi, I'm Sarah Napoli. Um, interestingly enough, I sold Tide, Folgers, and Zest for 11 years <laughs> at Roger Campbell. So I am a believer in NASCAR. I just can't afford to uh, buy any sponsor a car right now. I own a company that makes day planners. Um, if anybody remembers what those are, they uh, are made out of paper, use a pen to uh, record important things. And I've uh, been in business 15 years. Just recently bought my partner out, so I'm going it alone and trying to reinvent myself, hoping to find my NASCAR. <laughs> Hi, I'm Diane Bennett. I'm with Interior Environments. We are a business furniture company based out of Novi. I am the Ann Arbor area manager. We sell business furniture. We provide solutions for your interiors. Very in tune to trends that are coming up with offices, productivity, all of those things. We listen to what your needs are and come up with solutions. Hi, my name is Rhea Caldwell. I'm a content producer and freelance writer. Mary Lou, she's so sorry to say um, And I also work for 2396 Monthly. They're a new magazine located in the Brighton area. If you need to know where to go to happy hour in those little towns, I'll let you know. Um, I also do um, content production film. And to be honest, my background is in project management and communications. Hi, I'm Amy Ma. <laughs> I am Christina Shinsky. I'm, I'm a regional sales director for Verve Mobile. Um, we are a leader in location-based mobile and tablet advertising. Um, most of my business, actually all of my business, is really conducted um, right now in Detroit. So little tiny clients um, called General Motors out there that I work quite a bit with. Um, so I'm happy to be back in Ann Arbor. I've actually been born, was born and raised in Ann Arbor. So it's nice to come to these things. And actually, Tim was nice enough to um, give me my very first job. And so we really, um, you know, stayed in contact throughout our career. So it's been very helpful. And obviously, it was a very um, informational uh, presentation today. Um, and then, I guess more locally in Ann Arbor, I'm actually um, heavily involved in the Junior League of Ann Arbor. We're always looking for new, um, bright, young, old, middle-aged women to join. So if anyone is interested um, in learning more about the Junior League of Ann Arbor, um, come find me before I leave or visit our website. Thanks. So you guys met me, but my son's looking for an internship this summer, so I might talk to you after yeah, your okay. okay. Hi, my name's Emily Frog. I'm a senior at Michigan State. It's finals week, but I'm graduating in December, so I still have a little bit of time. Um, I have a broad range of experience from sales and marketing and PR, and thanks, Tim, for the presentation. Sure. Hi, I'm Curtis Sherman from Prince Studios, um, and, and uh, I'm a commercial editorial and portrait photographer, which covers almost everything except for weddings. Um, if you're a runner, you've probably seen me facing the direction when running at me, or if you're running a marathon, I might have been running with you with a camera, the smaller one. If you know. um, and uh, I've been able to do products, uh, portraits, digital portraits that uh, give a little more personality than a typical mugshot that most people use. And uh, the images that I shoot of these meetings go up on Group's Facebook page. Thank you. I'm Derek Maravon, CEO of Ingenix Digital Marketing. And uh, Emily, we're going to miss you. You've been a great intern. Thank you. But, um, you know, Ingenix is a digital agency. We focus on helping the companies reach their business goals uh, through lead generation and content marketing. So, if anybody's interested in that, come talk to us. Uh, Tim, I did learn a ton from your presentation. I can't tell you enough how, how great it was. And I'd love the referral to your, your father-in-law, did you say? Yeah. yeah. We'd, love, I, we'd love to have him. Right. Who, wants, who wants the father-in-law to come speak? <laughs> yeah, we do. Because we want to know, you know, if we have a $10,000 budget, where's that niche? So I love that thing. So we'll get him. 
But um, so next week we have another great speaker, a uh, guy. He actually teaches um, out of Michigan State with me to do a driver's license, but his name is Graham Davis, and he is in charge of the Detroit office of Trust Scott Rossman, which is a big PR firm, uh, headquartered in Lansing with offices in Detroit and I think Grand Rapids. And uh, he's going to be talking about the changing media landscape and how that's really changing PR and marketing. So I, I've seen this talk, it's similar to the one he gives at MSU, and it's wonderful. So make sure you come out next week for that, Graham Davis. And um, thanks again to our sponsor, remember May 6th, get your button, and you can wear it all around to your friends, you can bring buttons for your kids. I got some of those glow in our bracelets for my kids, so grab them if you got kids. But uh, vote May 6th, make sure to vote May 6th to support our sponsor. And um, thanks for coming. Go out and help others, make some money, and uh, have fun in the process. Let's give Tim Bush, Tim Bush one final round of applause. Tim Bush, thanks, sir. See you next week. Hopefully, it'll be 80 next week. Let's hope for 80, all right? All right. Thanks. See you.